My name is Elisha, and this is my story. It all began when Elias, a great prophet of God, approached me while I was laboring in the fields of Arava. I was the son of Saphet, residing in Abel Meol. That day was destined to alter the course of my life. Elias walked past me and cast his mantle upon me, a gesture I recognized as a divine calling. Without hesitation, I abandoned the oxen and followed Elias. Allow me to kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you, I said to him. And he replied, Go back, for what have I done to you? So, I turned back, sacrificed the oxen, and cooked their flesh with the plowshares as firewood. I distributed it among the people. Afterward, I rose and followed Elias. The years spent by his side were years of learning and preparation. I witnessed many miracles and gained profound insights into the faithfulness of God. Elias was a fervent and courageous man of God. His faith was unshakable, and I aspired to possess such strength and faith. A memorable moment occurred when Elias challenged the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. He mocked their inability to call down fire from heaven. Then, with a simple prayer, he summoned the fire of the Lord, which consumed the offering, the wood, the stones, and the dust, even licking up the water around the altar. On that day, the power of God manifested undeniably, and the people of Israel acknowledged that the Lord is God. Following the triumph on Mount Carmel, I experienced many more events by Elias' side. Every moment with him was a lesson about the nature of God and his might. Yet, among all the days spent with Elias, the most extraordinary was the day of his departure. Elias knew his time had come. He asked me to stay in Bethel, but I sensed the gravity of the moment and insisted, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So, we went together to Bethel. There, the sons of the prophets warned me about what would befall my master. I was already aware and asked them to remain silent. Elias once again urged me to stay while he journeyed to Jericho. Yet, I reiterated my determination, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. Together, we proceeded to Jericho. Once again, the sons of the prophets cautioned me, and once again, I requested their silence. Finally, we arrived at the Jordan. Elias took his mantle, struck the water, and the waters parted. We walked through on dry ground. As we walked, Elias asked me, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. I requested a double portion of his spirit, a challenging plea, but he responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am taken from you, it will be granted to you, if not, it will not be so. While we were still talking, a fiery chariot with fiery horses suddenly appeared, separating us. Elias ascended to the sky, surrounded by a whirlwind. I witnessed it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. After that, I never saw him again. In response to the unfolding events, I took my own garments and tore them into two parts. Engaged in profound contemplation over these extraordinary occurrences, I pondered the path that lay before me. The depth of the responsibility I bore became apparent, it was a burden, yet also an immense privilege. The mantle of Elijah, now resting upon my shoulders, transcended mere symbolism, it served as a perpetual reminder of the calling to wholeheartedly serve God and his people with my entire being. Reflecting upon the words of Elijah and the wonders he had wrought, each not merely a display of power but a lesson on the nature and character of God, I found myself tasked with continuing this journey. I, too, was to become a conduit through which the love, justice, and power of God could flow. Acknowledging that I was not alone on this journey brought solace. The God who had supported Elijah would also be with me. The same God who had answered Elijah on Mount Carmel, parted the waters of the Jordan, and performed myriad extraordinary deeds would stand by my side. I placed my trust in the assurance that, in every challenge I faced, His wisdom and strength would guide me. Simultaneously, I recognized my own humanity. 
like any other, I harbor doubts and fears. True strength, however, lay in acknowledging our dependence on God. Faith meant not the absence of doubts, but the courage to press forward, trusting that God would walk with me, directing each step, just as he had done with Elijah. As I journeyed through the lands of Israel, bearing the legacy of Elijah and reflecting on the mission entrusted to me by God, these truths were a constant meditation. Each day presented a new opportunity for learning, growth, and service. In every act of service, I witnessed God's hand not only in my life, but also in the lives of the entire people of Israel. The journey would not be easy, yet it would be filled with purpose and significance, guided by the hand of the God who calls, empowers, and utilizes his servants for the glory and welfare of his people. Lifting the fallen mantle of Elijah, I turned and stood at the bank of the Jordan. With Elijah's mantle, I struck the water and exclaimed, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? The waters parted, creating a path on either side, and I crossed over. The sons of the prophets in Jericho witnessed this spectacle and declared, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. Approaching me, they bowed in reverence. Now, as the bearer of Elijah's mantle, I stood at the threshold of a new chapter in my life. My inaugural act as a prophet unfolded when the men of Jericho approached me, lamenting the city's tainted water and the barrenness of the land. In response, I commanded, bring me a new bowl and fill it with salt. They complied, fetching a new bowl and filling it with salt. And so, I embarked on a journey to the spring of water, sprinkled salt into it, and declared, Thus says the Lord, I have healed these waters, from now on, there shall be no more death, no more barrenness. And the waters were healed unto this day, in accordance with the word I had spoken. On the path from Jericho to Bethel, some youths mocked me, shouting, Go up, bald head! Go up, bald head! I turned to them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. Lo and behold! Two bears came out of the woods and tore apart forty-two of these youths. It was a time when respect for the word of God and his servants was paramount, and blasphemy was not tolerated. After the incident with the youths in Bethel, I, Elisha, walked alone, pondering deeply on what had just transpired. The ridicule of the youths had not only wounded me personally but also called into question the authority bestowed upon me by God. The divine response to my curse was swift and severe, a painful reminder of the power of God and the seriousness with which he expects respect for his servants. Yet, in my heart, I questioned whether I had acted hastily in cursing these youths. Was my reaction driven by wounded pride or genuine concern for the honor of God? These questions echoed in my mind, mingling with sorrow for the youths and their families. I knew that the responsibility of a prophet is not only to be an instrument of judgment but also of mercy and understanding. I reflected on the nature of the ministry, often placing its bearers in situations of great emotional and spiritual tension. The boundary between defending the holiness of God and having compassion for those still learning to walk in His ways is delicate and complex. I wondered if there could have been another way to handle the situation a way that could teach the same lesson but with less suffering. The path of the prophet is one of constant learning and humility. I understood that, despite my role as a tool in God's hands, I was still human, fallible, and limited. This realization brought a sense of humility and the constant need to seek God's guidance in every step, every word, and every action. As I continued my journey, I carried this reflection with me, a reminder of the necessity to always seek wisdom and direction from God in my service. Every interaction, every encounter was an opportunity to faithfully and authentically represent God by balancing justice with mercy and power with love. After this incident, I ascended Mount Carmel and then returned to Samaria. In Samaria, my journey continued with many signs and wonders. I recall a remarkable event with a woman from Shunem. She was an extraordinary woman who insisted that I dine in her house whenever I passed by. She even built a small room on the roof for me to rest. In gratitude, I asked her what I could do for her. 
despite her hesitation to ask for anything. My servant Jeez had noticed that the woman was childless, and her husband was old. So, I called her to me and said, at this time next year, you will hold a son in your arms. Initially, she did not believe my words. However, as I had spoken, she conceived and bore a son at the appointed time. The story of the Shunammite woman's son holds a special place in my heart. Years after his birth, the young lad went to the field to meet his father, one of the harvest workers. Suddenly, he complained of a headache and was brought to his mother at noon. In her arms, he breathed his last. Driven by unwavering faith, the woman did not hesitate. She placed the boy in my chamber and closed the door. Then, she ascended Mount Carmel to approach me. As she drew near, I sent Jeez to inquire about her well-being, that of her husband, and the boy. She replied that all was well but continued her journey until she knelt before me, burdened with concerns. When she recounted the incident, I dispatched Jeez with my staff to lay it upon the boy's face. Yet, the mother insisted I come personally. Entering the house, I beheld the lifeless boy lying on my bed. I closed the door behind me and prayed to the Lord. Then, I lay over the boy, mouth to mouth, eyes to eyes, hands to hands. As I lingered over him, warmth returned to his body. Rising, I walked around the house and lay over him again. The boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. I called Jeez and commanded him to summon the Shunammite. When she arrived, I said, take your son. She came, fell at my feet, bowed to the ground, then took her son and departed. Having restored life to the Shunammite's son through the power of God, I withdrew to a corner of the house, immersed in profound contemplation. The magnitude of the miracle that had just occurred overwhelmed me. Life, this precious and mysterious gift, had been reclaimed in the hands of a servant of God. I pondered the power that flowed through me, a power not my own but borrowed from God to fulfill His purposes. I reflected on the nature of life and death and the immense love and mercy of God. The restoration of life to the boy was not only a testimony to God's power but also to His deep care for each of His children. The miracle that had just transpired was a sign of God's presence and providence, even in the most desolate circumstances. I also contemplated the faith of the Shunammite. Her determination to seek help and her refusal to accept her son's death as final spoke volumes about the true nature of faith. She sought no certainties but acted in the conviction that God could intervene. Her faith served as a powerful reminder that, even as a prophet, my confidence should always rest in the faithfulness and power of God, not in my own abilities. Finally, I pondered the mystery of divine will. Why are some healed while others are not? Why do some miracles occur and others do not? These questions often remain enigmatic and are part of God's unfathomable plan. In the chambers of my mind, questions lingered, unanswered. Yet, I knew that my task was not to comprehend all the ways of God but to trust in them and faithfully serve, irrespective of the outcome. With these considerations in mind, I continued my journey, aware of the responsibility and privilege of being a servant of God, a conduit of His grace and power in a broken and needy world. Another significant moment in my ministry unfolded when the widow of one of the prophet's sons approached me. She was in despair, for her husband had passed away, leaving her in debt. The creditor was on the brink of taking her two sons as slaves to settle the debts. She pleaded for my assistance, and I inquired about what she had at home. Your maidservant has nothing at home except a jar of oil, she replied. Upon hearing this, I instructed the widow to borrow many empty vessels from her neighbors. Please, not just a few, I emphasized. When she brought the vessels, I told her to shut the door behind her and her sons and pour the oil into the vessels. Miraculously, the oil continued to flow until all the vessels were filled. When she informed me that all the vessels were full and the oil had ceased to flow, I instructed her, go, sell the oil and pay your debt. You and your sons live on the rest. 
As the widow departed with her vessels filled with oil, a profound sense of reflection enveloped me. I contemplated how remarkably God had provided for this woman and her sons. The oil miracle was not just a display of divine power but also a lesson on faith, providence, and the significance of acting in accordance with divine guidance. I pondered the words I had spoken to the widow, please, not just a few vessels. These words spoke of an anticipation of abundance, a belief in God's generosity. It served as a reminder for myself and all who would hear this story that when God acts, He does so in full and complete measure. God is not confined by our notions of possibility, He is the God of abundance. The act of closing the door while the miracle unfolded also prompted contemplation. It was a symbolic gesture indicating that certain works of God should be experienced in intimacy, away from skeptical gazes and unbelief. It was a lesson on the value of silence and trust in God, even when others may not see or understand what He is doing. Furthermore, I reflected on the responsibility that comes with receiving a miracle. The widow not only received the oil but also received instructions on what to do next. It reminded me that God's miracles are not only meant to rescue us from difficult situations but also to guide us on how to live and thrive after divine intervention. God cares not only for our immediate needs but also for the paths we tread after our prayers are answered. In the course of my journey as a prophet, I marveled at how God chose to employ His servants. I considered myself merely a conduit, a vessel through which God extended His hand to assist a desperate widow. This act deepened in me a sense of humility and gratitude for being used by God to bless others, a constant reminder that all power and every good gift come from Him. During a time of famine, I found myself in Gilgal with the sons of the prophets. As we sat there, I instructed my servant, set the large pot and make a soup for the sons of the prophets. One of them went to the field to gather herbs and stumbled upon a wild vine, from which he harvested wild gourds. Unaware of their toxicity, he filled his cloak with them and cut them into the soup pot. As they ate, they exclaimed, Man of God, there is death in the pot, and could not consume the meal. So, I commanded, Bring flour, and as I cast it into the pot, I declared, Serve the people so that they can eat, and there was no harm in the pot thereafter. In another instance, a man brought the first fruits of the harvest to the sons of the prophets, twenty barley loaves and fresh ears of grain. It seemed insufficient for a hundred men, but I declared, Give it to the people to eat, for thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left. And so it happened, they ate, and there was an abundance left, in accordance with the word of the Lord. My journey as a prophet led me to interact with kings and commanders. One such encounter was with Naaman, the commander of the army of the king of Syria. He was a great man in the eyes of his lord and highly esteemed, for through him, the lord had given the Syrians deliverance, but he was afflicted with leprosy. An Israelite girl serving Naaman's wife said to her mistress, Oh, that my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria. He would cure him of his leprosy. Acting on his lord's recommendation, Naaman came to me, bringing valuable gifts. However, I did not even go out to meet him. Instead, I sent a messenger to instruct him, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. Initially angered by what he perceived as a lack of respect and the command to bathe in an Israelite river, Naaman refused. Yet, his servants persuaded him to heed my instruction. He immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, just as the man of God had spoken, and his skin was restored becoming as clean as that of a child. Following this miraculous event, Naaman returned to me with his retinue, standing before me and declaring, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Accept the gift from your servant. However, I responded, As the Lord lives, before whom I stand, I will take nothing. Despite his insistence, I declined. Naaman then requested soil, as much as two mules could carry, for he vowed not to offer sacrifices or burnt offerings to any other gods but the Lord. 
After Naaman's departure, an incident occurred involving my servant Gehazi. Coveting the gifts Naaman had brought, he pursued after him. When Naaman saw him, he alighted from his chariot, inquiring, Is all well? Gehazi lied, claiming that I had sent him to request a talent of silver and two changes of clothing for two young men of the sons of the prophets. Naaman promptly gave him more than he had requested. Upon Gehazi's return and presentation before me, I inquired about his whereabouts. Again, he lied, stating that he had not gone anywhere. Seeing through the falsehood, I said. In the aftermath of Giski's departure, my heart bore witness to a profound disconnection as the man turned away from his chariot and approached me. It marked a season where acquisition of wealth, receipt of garments, and possession of olive groves, vineyards, flocks, herds, servants, and maidservants took precedence. As a consequence, Naaman's leprosy was destined to cling to him and his descendants perpetually, and Giski, having left my presence as a leper, now bore the pallor of snow. In the wake of Giski's departure, my mind wrestled with the weighty thoughts of his dishonest actions and the gravity of the punishment I had imposed upon him. My position as a prophet of God bestowed upon me great authority and power, entwined with an enormous responsibility. The episode with Giski served as a poignant reminder of the consequences of corruption and greed, underscoring the paramount importance of integrity in serving God. Contemplating the dynamics between a leader and his disciples, I pondered the actions of Giski. He had stood by my side during pivotal events, witnessing numerous miracles. Yet, he succumbed to the allure of material gain. It prompted me to question whether, in my teachings or example as a spiritual leader, I had faltered in any aspect. The conduct of Giski mirrored my own ministry. These reflections led me to contemplate not just the act of teaching but also the imperative to live out the principles we preach. The lie of Giski and its subsequent retribution served as a stark reminder that God observes and judges all our actions. As a prophet, my acute awareness of divine justice informed me that falsehoods, especially in matters of divine service, could not be tolerated. Nevertheless, the severity of the punishment compelled me to reflect on the equilibrium between God's justice and mercy. I pondered whether there existed room for repentance and restoration for Giski. Moreover, the situation with Giski coerced me to consider the perils of materialism and how it could divert even those close to the truth. The allure of wealth and material comfort remains a persistent temptation, capable of distracting even those walking with God. These contemplations reinforce the significance of teaching and exemplifying a lifestyle characterized by simplicity, contentment, and a focus on spiritual matters. Ultimately, the realization struck me that every action bears consequences not only for ourselves but also for those around us. Giski's punishment would not only impact him but also his descendants, underscoring the enduring influence of our decisions and the responsibility to live justly and with integrity. With these reflections, I continued my journey, aware of the challenges of the ministry and the constant need for seeking wisdom and guidance from God, both for myself and those under my leadership. Once again, the sons of the prophets approached, asserting that our dwelling place had become too cramped. They proposed a journey to the Jordan, where we could cut wood and build a larger abode. I ascended, joining them on the venture. During the woodcutting expedition, a mishap occurred when the iron axe head plummeted into the water. The distraught prophet exclaimed, Alas, master, it was borrowed. Inquiring about its whereabouts, I had it pointed out to me. Without hesitation, I cut off a piece of wood, cast it into the water, and miraculously, the iron axe head floated. Instructing him to retrieve it, he reached out, and the seemingly lost tool was restored to his grasp. In the aftermath of this incident with the floating axe head in the Jordan River, I retreated for a moment of introspection and reflection. Though this miracle may have seemed smaller in scale compared to others wrought by God through me, it encapsulated profound and meaningful lessons. The simplicity of the miracle, the restoration of a borrowed object, 
prompted contemplation on God's attention and care even in the minutiae of life. I reflected on the significance of the mundane and how God concerns himself with our daily worries. The young prophet had fretted over something many would consider inconsequential, a borrowed axe. Yet, every concern of ours is worthy of God's attention. It served as a reminder that, as a servant of God, I should cultivate the same sensitivity and compassion for the small needs of those around me. Deep in contemplation about the nature of miracles, I pondered how they need not always be grand or spectacular. God works in both the vast and the minuscule, and every miracle, whether significant or trivial, is a demonstration of His power and love. These musings led me to humility and service, recognizing that every act of God, no matter how insignificant it may seem, is part of His sovereign plan and deserves our gratitude and admiration. Additionally, I meditated on the themes of responsibility and integrity. The young prophet was distressed over losing something that did not belong to him, indicating a sense of responsibility and honesty. This prompted me to reflect on the importance of teaching and exemplifying these virtues. As a spiritual leader, I felt a duty to foster integrity and character among the sons of the prophets. On another occasion, during a famine, a man brought Elisha bread from the first fruits, twenty barley loaves and fresh ears of grain. It was scarce for so many people, but I declared, Give to the people to eat, for thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left. And so it happened, they ate, and there was some left, just as the word of the Lord had promised. Continuing on my journey, I became increasingly aware of God's constant presence in all aspects of life. I committed even more to trust Him in all circumstances, knowing that He cares for every detail. There was a time when the king of Syria waged war against Israel. He devised secret plans, but I, as the prophet, repeatedly revealed to the king of Israel what was happening. Every time the king of Syria planned an ambush, I sent a message to the king of Israel to warn him. This angered the king of Syria, suspecting betrayal among his own people. A servant reassured him, saying, It is not one of us, my lord king, but Elisha, the prophet in Israel, who tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. In response, the king of Syria sent horses, chariots, and a great army by night to surround the city where I was. When my servant saw the army in the morning, he panicked and asked, What shall we do? I replied, Do not be afraid for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then I prayed to the Lord and said, Lord, open his eyes, that he may see. The Lord opened the eyes of my servant, and he saw that the mountain was full of fiery chariots and horses all around me. The Syrians came down against me, and I prayed, Lord, strike this people with blindness. The Lord answered my prayer, and the Syrians became blind, just as I had requested. I said to them, This is not the way, this is not the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. I led them to Samaria, and when their eyes were opened, they saw that they were in the midst of Samaria. The king of Israel, seeing them, asked if he should kill them. I replied, Do not kill them. Feed them and give them drink, and let them go to their master. A great feast was prepared for them and after they had eaten and drunk, the king of Israel released them. The Syrians dared not invade the land of Israel anymore. After this incident, the Syrians besieged Samaria, and the famine in the city became so severe that a measure of wheat flour was sold for eighty shekels, and a quarter of a cab of doves dung for five shekels. Meanwhile, the king of Israel walked along the wall, and a woman cried out for help. She told a harrowing tale of desperation and cannibalism that shook the king. Blaming me, Elisha, for this catastrophe, the king swore to take my head. As he sent a messenger to execute his judgment, I said to the elders who were with me, See, how the son of Ahab sends a man to take off my head. Before the messenger arrived, I said to the elders, Close the door, hold him fast with the door. Do you not hear the sound of the feet of his master behind him? While I was still speaking to them, 
the messenger came, and I said, Hear the word of the Lord, Tomorrow, about this time, a measure of the finest flour will be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in Samaria. The officer, on whose arm the king leaned, responded to the man of God, Even if the Lord were to make windows in heaven, could such a thing happen? I declared, You shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. As it came to pass, for lepers were at the city gate, pondering among themselves, Why should we stay here until we die? If we say, Let us enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Let us go to the camp of the Syrians. If they spare us, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall only die. They went to the Syrian camp and found it deserted. The Lord had caused the Syrian army to hear the noise of chariots, horses, and a great army, so they fled, leaving their camp behind. The lepers ate and drank, took silver, gold, and clothes, and hid them. Then they returned, entered another tent, took things from there, and hid them. They said to one another, We are not doing right. This day is a day of good news, and we are silent. If we wait until morning light, punishment will overtake us. Let us go and tell the king's household. They went, called out to the city gates, and reported, We went to the Syrian camp, and behold, no one was there, not a human sound, only tethered horses and donkeys, and the tents just as they were. The city gates opened, and the news was proclaimed in the king's household. The people went out and plundered the Syrian camp. Thus, a measure of fine flour was sold for a silver coin, and two measures of barley for a silver coin, as the Lord had spoken. The king had appointed the officer, on whose arm he leaned, to guard the gate, but the people trampled on him in the gate, and he died, just as the man of God had foretold when the king descended to him. The fulfillment of the Lord's word brought relief and joy but also a solemnity concerning the nature of divine justice. The fate of the officer who doubted the word of God was a somber reminder of the gravity with which God views unbelief and mockery. It reflected the power of words spoken in the name of God. As a prophet, I was a messenger of his truths, and each of my words carried the weight of divine authority. The death of the officer served as a sobering reminder that prophetic utterances are not mere speculations or wishes but declarations of what God will surely do. This reinforced in me the responsibility to speak only what God had commanded, without adding or subtracting. The death of the officer who doubted the word of the Lord was not just a punishment but also a demonstration that God is faithful to fulfill his word. It reminded me that while God is infinitely merciful, he is also just, and his promises of blessing and judgment are always fulfilled. With these thoughts in mind, I continued to serve as God's messenger, aware of the power of his words and the responsibility to speak and act in accordance with his will in all circumstances. The story of Elisha, as recounted in the scriptures, concludes with the miracle that occurred after his death when a revived man touched his bones. This event symbolizes the enduring impact and spiritual influence of Elisha, even after his departure from this world. There are no detailed accounts of his life beyond this point in the scriptures. Elisha served as a powerful instrument of God, performing many miracles, advising kings, and profoundly influencing the nation of Israel. His life is an example of faith dedicated to God and his divine purposes. My name is Elisha. And this is my story.